Good evening. Welcome to the Adventurers Club of Los Angeles. I'm your host for the evening, Rich Mayfield, member 1211. I'm the first vice president this year and your program's chairman. Tonight, we have Alex Shoemate, our president. It's an honor to have you here, sir. Uh, member 1210. 1210. So, um, Alec and I kind of came on board at the same time here. Within like a week of each other. It yeah. was you, me, and Andy. We came in just as like a block. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great to have you here tonight. You um, are going to talk about you getting deep into the Amazon, right? You went deep. So we want to do a deep dive into, into what that experience was like. Um, but first, remember that this is a live uh, stream. So people are watching live. People will probably put questions in the comments, and we'll do a Q&A in the end. So if you're watching this live, make sure you put comments in there, and we'll do a Q&A at the end. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Only about half of you watching have actually subscribed to our channel, so it helps us out. If, uh, if the rest of those people were to subscribe, that would be a huge boost to our channel. Um, the other thing we want to talk about, you've been running the um, happy hour Zoom call every week, right? Yeah. So what's that about? Can you, can you give me like a rundown of what, what happens? Sure. So for any members that might be watching, uh, we've been sending out the email notifications each week. Uh, it's set up as a Zoom call, so you'll get the link in your email inbox and also on the member Facebook page. But we've just been doing a little kind of member get together, 6.30 p.m. every week, right before the live stream starts. And uh, we just get together from members from all over the country. Uh, sometimes they'll bring artifacts or stories or, you know, the topics of conversation literally range across the spectrum of adventures, I'm sure you can imagine. So if you haven't been checking those out, I encourage everybody to check them out and, and connect with your brothers from uh, all over the country. Absolutely. I think everybody appreciates that, that you're doing that. It's great. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're interested in um, member happenings and, and like the business of the club, check out that Zoom call and that, that's where we'll be doing that stuff, right? Absolutely. Cool. All right. So Amazon Jungle, you got hooked up with an expedition to go down to the Amazon and to visit um, a fairly remote tribe way, way, way back up, up the river and, in, and into the heart of darkness, right? <laughs> yeah. Essentially. So, you know, when I first came into this club, um, yeah, I can say openly that my resume was one of the weaker ones, probably. I think they were, you know, very welcoming and encouraging about, you know, building this life of adventure. But I was still a young guy just trying to get into this stuff. Uh, at the same time, I was getting into the Explorers Club. And both of those were very much aided by a member here, Steve Elkins, who's mm -hmm. a member of 1209. And as you know, unless, you know, people have not heard, he had some of his own jungle adventures discovered oh, a yeah. lost city down in Honduras. <laughs> oh, yeah. So kind of following in that path and being interested in, in those kind of experiences, I was keeping my ear to the ground within the Explorers Club and seeing if there was any trips that were going out. And initially, I had heard about this one trip going out to Cambodia. Okay. Which ended up happening later on. It's a different story. But I reached out to the guy and said, hey, you know, what's the deal with this Cambodia trip? And he said, well, actually, it's full. But, you know, and I told him I was an illustrator. That was my background and kind of what I had to bring to the table as an mm -hmm. expedition artist. And uh, he said, but there's this other trip that's going out in October uh, to the Amazon. We took an uh, Explorers Club flag down there in February, and the team's going back to finish up some of their, uh, they were filming a documentary and doing some general kind of broad research about you know, okay. their customs and culture. And they had an open slot, and so he asked if I wanted to tag along. And so very quickly, uh, all of a sudden, you know, I was kind of going from zero to 60, mm -hmm. getting on a plane, with, How much time did you have between they, they said, hey, there's a spot, and between you were on a plane? I had, in that case, several months. So I had time okay. to, to prep and kind of get myself ready. But a lot of this still, you know, never having been in a, a jungle thing, I was making all kinds of mistakes going in in terms of clothes and footwear and, like, uh -huh. trying to spray DEET on my clothes and reading little, you know, manuals online of, like, how to do, you know, jungle you, exploration stuff. You got to spray a lot of DEET, right? Yeah, I got like three bottles and just laid out all my clothes for the trip on like yeah. a clothesline outside. And just Did you like disintegrate any, any clothes? Did you disintegrate them like with the synthetics? Because I know DEET will like eat up some stuff, right? No, well, I, I don't know about the synthetics. My problem was is like an idiot, I brought a bunch of cotton because I thought, oh, cotton's breathable. <laughs> it's great in the jungle, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be great. It'll yeah. be fantastic. And I got these like nice waterproof boots. Like it'll keep my feet nice and dry. Uh -huh. And so I was just a sweaty mess the whole time. Like Ugh. the sun would come up, we'd walk 10 feet out of our, you know, hammocks and I'm a sweaty mess. Yeah, so. I mean, I mean, I think you'd do that no matter what clothes yeah. you had on. But cotton was just a little bit, you, you didn't have like a pair of Levi's, right? No, I didn't bring okay. Levi's. I, was, I wasn't that bad. No, but in retrospect, you know, all the guys had the quick dry shirts oh, yeah. and, and pants. That was the way to go. It makes a tremendous difference, doesn't it? Oh yeah, well, when right. I did go to Cambodia the next time, I felt like a travel, you know, like a well-traveled, like 
Yeah, salty sailor. I was like, I got the right stuff now. So you had a month to jump on this expedition, and, and your, your piece in it was to be the expedition illustrator, basically capturing everything um, as, as like a sketch artist, right? Yeah, so there's a huge history of expedition illustration that goes way back, obviously, to before there were cameras. Um, and the interesting thing, you know, back in the day when guys would go out, like Lewis and Clark were kind of sketch artists in their own right. Uh, the Shackleton expedition took sketch artists along. All the old like military campaigns you can think about that uh, Caesar was going on or Napoleon were going on, they had artists along to kind of create a visual record of the stuff they were seeing. And even when you got into, I think I mentioned Shackleton, even when you got into the era of photography, there was still this overlap of bringing artists along for kind of the subjective, I guess, lens that an artist brings. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, not being a scientist myself, that's always been kind of my justification for being a part of, of this club or the Explorers Club is that I'm an illustrator. I can work pretty quickly in the field. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I bring to the table is kind of this, this lost art of field illustration. And what, what was your media? Like, how did, how, what, what, did you, what did you sketch on while you were out in the field? So again, all this, and looking back, it's just, it was such a good learning experience. So I had this grand plan that I was gonna take down a bunch of watercolors to try and do some paintings. Uh -huh. um, and I wanted to get some water-based pencils so I could draw pencils over the sketches. Okay. Now, because of the humidity and the fact that the pencils were water-based, they turned to mush in my pack. <laughs> so, like, like immediately? Immediately. Like as soon as I got down there, I tried to have them like double bagged and you know, keeping all sketchbooks dry and safe. Right. The pencils went right out the window. And so what I was left over with, which ironically, and this is kind of another segue, so I also do some, some illustration for the Marine Corps art program. Uh -huh. I'm a civilian artist for the Marine Corps. And the gold standard for them is Prismacolor pencils, which was found out by a Marine Corps artist in World War II, um, Howard Brody, I believe his name was. I could be uh -huh. mixing that with somebody else. But he came ashore at Guadalcanal with a bunch of fancy art supplies. They all fell into the surf, got completely ruined. And so he started swiping wax pencils, which are essentially Prismacolors, from uh -huh. the map tents. And those were just like the hardiest pencils of all time. Right. And they could hold up in any environment. Um, does the wax ever melt, or is it pretty pretty good? Like through it was the, pretty in terms heat. of just raw humidity, uh -huh. they held up totally fine. I mean, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's some kind of melting point. But or like if you heat, left them out in the direct know? sun, they yeah, might yeah, melt. Yeah, yeah. But you know, being under the canopy, it was more just that kind of humidity in the air right. that really just melted the the water base. So essentially, what I was doing is I was limited to using um, a couple just graphite pencils I had brought. Uh -huh. I did have a couple of those wax pencils, and then occasionally trying to add some like white highlights or you know other colors in. It was me just like mushing it against the paper. <laughs> now, now in the um, artist community, is, is mm -hmm. sketching with pencil like the graphite pencil? Is that is that like a purist type type media, or or do people do, do artists like to get pretty complicated with their with their tools? I don't know. I think it's you know the cool thing about art is that you know everybody's kind of got a different way to do it, and I think the main takeaway that I had from this trip for sure is that if anybody's ever traveling anywhere. Um, you know, bring a sketchbook just for fun. Yeah. Because it, it draws people in to what you're doing in a really, really interesting way, much more than photography. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the people I was with on this trip were getting some great footage and great photos. But the cameras in a way kind of, there's something about the instantaneous quality of them that like people were there and kind of knew that they were being photographed or filmed. Yeah, but it's not. But there's no engagement with yeah. it. There was no curiosity of like, what does a picture look like? What? You know, so they, they kind of dropped away, which maybe for their purposes was what they wanted, was that they just kind of fell into the background. Mm -hmm. As an artist there, I frequently had groups that would just gather around, and they were just so curious about what you're drawing, how you're drawing it. You know, they'd be fascinating. And, you know, in, in this case, I don't know, you know, they're a pretty remote tribe. They're not completely cut off from the world, but I don't know what types of illustrations they've seen or drawing te right. techniques they've seen. So me coming down there and using this very kind of classical illustrative style could have been a totally new thing to them. Yeah. And uh, it was just kind of a fun, it, it gave it a different uh, dynamic to the group, which I think did justify itself in the end. And I think was kind of the, the fun wrinkle this time around, because a lot of people have been down there before, was right. now you had the art element in play. And even though it was a small, I mean, I'm not contributing anything of like on the level of the science and the research that some of the people on the trip were doing, but it just kind of added an extra cultural connection element or even though we couldn't speak the same language, they were fascinated by the drawings, and they'd come around and giggle at who I was drawing, because I was always trying to be sneaky, too. Like, I'd draw someone from across the camp and kind of, like, 
be sneaking peeks. And then eventually they'd realize they were being drawn and kind of stiffen up like they didn't know yeah. whether they should, like, if they could move. I mean, I've never, you know, so I want to talk about how you got there, yeah. right, and how you got to, to this point. But I, since we're talking about that, I do want to show this picture that Andy has up right now of the, um, of the people gathered around you. Because I've never seen people, like, I, you know, people are interested in photographers, but this is a whole new level of engagement. Yeah. And I feel like you really have to, to, to draw someone. I, I think, you know, these people probably really felt seen. Yeah. You know, because you, you know, take a picture, they're like, oh, they're just snapping photos. But if you're drawing them, you're, you, you are paying a lot more attention to them. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thing you bring that up because from my experience, and again, there was a huge language barrier, so a lot got lost in translation. But they're very aware of, of the changes that are going on in the world, and they're very aware of the value that their traditional culture has. You know, they're, they're, they want to market it. They know that it has value, their traditional practices, and they know that all these Westerners want to come in and take photos and, and film them. And I had read in an article, I think it was the Matisse tribe, um, from a previous documentary group that had been down there and embedded with them. And the takeaway from one of the Matisse elders was something along the lines of, uh, well, you come down here and you take your photos and those last forever. But you give us stuff, you know, like whether it's boat motors or machetes that eventually rust and fall to pieces. So this mm -hmm. is not a fair trade. So there was, at least in that case, and maybe to a bigger degree, um, some cynicism. Mm -hmm. maybe, about the photography, that it was this kind of instantaneous, like you're right, you're not really, in get, you, you're there, you snap the picture and you get on with your business. Whereas I think you're right, the art that you're sitting down and really, you're studying somebody's face, you're studying their expressions, you're studying their gestures. Mm -hmm. you know, you're taking time to try and copy that. And, uh, you know, people in general, I mean, even, you know, here, if you started sketching, people always just kind of poke their nose and, and see what you're, yeah. what you're up to. So well, that kind of compounded on itself and it just became a really interesting dynamic. You mentioned the sub subjective aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, there's the old expression, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Yeah. So do you think like a, um, a sketch is worth a thousand pictures? Because really you're, you're, you're taking all these pictures with your mind's eye yeah. and you're combining them into one thing. You're catching everything that you think is important about that scene in one thing, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that is kind of where the you know, the, the artist, especially like an illustrator, come from an illustrator background, which mm -hmm. is very narrative. Like the whole purpose of illustration is not, it's not abstract art, it's not interpretive. You're trying to tell a story and you're trying to tell it in as, as boiled down and compact an image as possible. So you're right, it is kind of taking a bunch of different moments and, uh, you know, combining them all into one singular, you know, ideally well-composed shot that kind of captures yeah. the spirit of, of a larger, you know, tribe or a larger ritual or whatever it may be. And uh, if it's done well, which is hard, I mean, I can't even say that I, you know, I learned so much on the trip just from like battling my own materials. But when travel art is done well, I have books and books of it that's just incredible that mm -hmm. I, I would much rather pour through the travel art than look at a photo, a photo book. Interesting. Yeah. I think most people, I mean, when you see like, and, and some of these people are masters, like some of these old school expedition artists yeah. were obviously masters of their craft. But the stories they're telling with the, the drawings they're doing is just, it's, it's everything. It's like all the romance of travel and seeing new things for the first time, you know, really just boiled down and, and transmitted through that, like, really human perspective. And it, it's, it's unlike anything else. That's cool. So let's show people what, 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 you, what you did. Um, for those not familiar with your art, I think it, 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 it's pretty unique. Um, so can we pop this picture up there, Andy? So this is your style of illustration. How would you describe this style of illustration? I think, I mean, a lot of uh, my background is I'm very much self-taught, uh, but I have had some, some training. Uh, what I do for, I work as a storyboard artist for a living, so I'd say my style is very like illustrative and, and realistic. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that I pride myself the most on is, is working fast. So I can crank out a drawing like that in like 20, 30 minutes. Wow. And that's 15 minutes after the guy got up to go do something else. Or in some cases, they get up to come look at what you're doing. And it's like, oh, I was, I was drawing you. <laughs> and so now I'm like trying to remember what you're sitting like. Yeah. But you try and, you know, block in quick things. And the nice thing especially is like, because in this case, especially with the tribe, they wore so little clothes, it was kind of like a figure drawing session. Yeah. You know, human anatomy is pretty universal across right. the board. So, you know, you didn't have to have some great, uh, you know, photo reference or visual reference for like 
what do the folds of his clothes look like or what kind of equipment is he wearing or what kind of right. cultural robes or whatever it may That's be. That's a skinny leg. You know yeah, how to it's draw just a skinny like this leg. guy is wearing some shorts and he's got some beads wrapped around him and this is like a human body and he was sitting like this. So you get the pose down and then you kind of fill in the, the details that you oh. already know. It's like I know that muscle's there and I know there's five fingers on a hand and you Let's can Let's take make another it look at this photo. Pop that up there. So yeah, if you look at this, it's amazing. All these are just strokes, right? Yeah. Like there's there's not a whole lot of shading going on or anything. Like it's like all the shading and stuff is done with a quick stroke, right? Yeah. No erasing? No, well the thing about the uh, the Prismacolor wax pencils is you can't erase with them. Oh, it's a one shot deal, huh? But it's kind of nice cuz it kind of forces your hand into committing. Yeah. You know, the hardest thing is when, when I get like a professional job, I'll just sit there hours like just stressing over one line uh -huh. and erasing it and redrawing it trying to get it perfect. Yeah. But it's kind of liberating you go out into the field and you got these these tools that you can't erase and you're kind of just bam. forced to it's like kind of performative. Like it's huh. art which is not usually a performative medium. Yeah. It's kind of private. Doing it in the field and doing it in front of an audience, all of a sudden it takes on a whole different dynamic and you kind of have this like pressure to perform like Right. Oh, well, these people know I'm here to do art, so I, I better do some good art, and I better do it quick, because they're waiting to see what I do. Yeah, I mean, the only performance art I've ever seen is very, we'll, we'll say, abstract. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this is not abstract at all. This yeah. is very detailed and, like you said, illustrative. Yeah. Like, I, I know what's going on in that scene. That looks really cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. So let's back up. Let's talk about how you actually got sure. deep into the Amazon, right? Yeah. So you flew in, right? Did you fly in with the team? Everybody leave from LA-ish or people fly in from everywhere? People were coming from all over the country. And I think the, the bulk of the team, or at least several of them, were coming from Florida. So I set off from LA by myself. I looked like such a clown in the airport because I had all this like Indiana Jones <laughs> adventure looking gear. Let's pop up that picture so we know what Alec looks like in the bush. No, not that one. There's a picture of Alec. Oh, is it the cool like walking through the jungle photo? Yeah. yeah I like that. Uh, you do look the part, I will say. Uh, you represent the brand well. Do you have the one of him walking through the, the bush? I mean, you can kind of tell. Yeah, he's got, you got the hat. No, but if you give me a couple minutes, okay. I can go to his, we'll, we'll go to his Facebook yeah, yeah. and find it. And so set off from LAX and flew into Bogota. So the team was all meeting up in Colombia. Okay. And we spent about a week in Colombia. And uh, the trip leader, a guy named Garrett Cooper, who's a uh, former Army guy, badass dude, he's the one who like, made all these inroads with this tribe just from like going down, as I understand it, just kind of by himself and paddling around the river and solo camping. I mean, he's as real as it gets. And uh, we met up with the team in Colombia, and we went down to kind of a, uh, a jungle reserve treehouse hotel type place to kind of get our bearings for okay. jungle stuff. And so we go out on day hikes and kind of familiarize ourselves with like different kinds of plants we're going to be encountering, different kinds of uh, you know, terrain, how to maneuver around, you know, muddy stretches, stuff like that. And uh, so we were there for a few days. And then we hopped on another plane and we flew down to uh, Letitia. I think I'm getting this right. Yeah, Letitia, which is in Colombia, right on the border with Brazil. Did some more kind of like jungle exposure type stuff there. And then we went down to Tabatinga, which I think is on the Brazilian side, where it's like the most open border you've ever seen. You cross and it's kind of an honor system. Yeah. to like check in with the authorities within 24 hours. You put like a hours. slip of paper in a box? Yeah, it's like, hey, if you're over here and you're going to stay for a while, like just check in at like the, the passport office or the immigration office within 24 hours. But like nobody's like checking your passport when you cross over. You right. just drive down, yeah. you know, past the street and you're in Brazil. And uh, we had chartered a boat that was going to take us eight hours um, downriver or upriver. Via which, boat. Via boat. Eight hours. Eight hours on That's that boat. That's a long boat ride. Yeah. And so when we first got on the river, we had to check in at this little, and, and the funny thing about this environment, and again, everything I'm saying is like based on my little window of personal experience. I'm by no means an expert on any of the politics of Brazil, mm -hmm. but as an outsider looking in, as somebody that loves history, it felt like the, the closest analog to like the American West. Yeah. I can imagine. Like when we first went into Brazil on the river, we had to check in at this military patrol boat and they checked our passports and checked us into Brazil. And you go down there, and it's like this weird ecosystem of different groups with different objectives. You know, and as you go farther down river and farther away from civilization, you know, you see the the illegal farmers or the illegal miners or loggers. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'd come by a boat on the side of the riverbank, and you'd see the chaff from the the logging that they've been doing all day. Uh, there was tons of missionaries down there, and the story was that the missionaries of all people had the best maps. 
and the best linguist of anybody. Hmm. That they could drop a missionary in there and within four months they'd be fluent in the native dialect and they'd disappear huh. into the jungle to go convert a bunch of people. Huh. And then you have the government that's kind of stretched thin and trying to, to keep an eye on things and, and you know, monitor and, and support these tribes. And then you have tribes that are all at varying levels of contact with the outside world. You know, this tribe in particular had a lot of contact and they actually had some like government housing in this uh, river town called Adelaia de Norte where they'd send their kids to get educated. But then there are other tribes in their territory that were still at the time uncontacted and they would have turf wars with each other. Which yeah. Would, yeah, and so back in like 2016, the story was is that this other tribe called the Karubo had gotten into a turf war with the Matisse, the tribe that we were visiting, and had killed a couple of their men to take their shotguns, which they had gotten from, you know, obviously the outside world. And so then they launched a counter raid against the Karubo, and I guess killed some Karubo guys. And then they were so upset about this ongoing violence between them that they painted themselves all up in war paint and stormed into Adelaide de Norte, the Funai, which handles all the indigenous uh, uh -huh. aspects of Brazil. They stormed their way into their, their station office and kicked the station chief out. And this is, this is the guy, this picture? Yeah, I have a picture of it. This is from 2016 where they're just forcing him down the street at Spear and Arrow So where did they kick him out? Just to the other end of town? I guess. They just <laughs> occupied his office. They just said, this guy is terrible at his job. And like, he's not, he's huh. not regulating the you know, intertribal relations. And uh, so we're, uh, we're kicking him out, huh. we're making the executive decision. He's not doing this job anymore. So it really is the Wild West. It feels like it. I mean, it feels like this, this really just raw, um, dynamic place. And so and then th here come these cowboys. You, let's throw that picture of you guys. Now, no, the picture of Alec. Oh, yeah, walking down in there. Yeah, yeah. And here come these cowboys, <laughs> yeah. right? Sticking out like so a So that's how thumb. you looked in LA. I mean, you look very much in place here. There, I fit in fine. But this is where you're dressed like an LAX? Yeah, LAX, I'm walking around like yeah. trying to like sheepishly tuck the hat behind my leg, you know, yeah. <laughs> my leg or something like that, you know. But so, I got all this like jungle looking gear. And, uh, you know, when I came back on the way back through customs, and especially because at that time I was bringing back all kinds of like bows and arrows and spears and stuff like uh -huh. that, I was definitely, I could see the security guys scramble as they saw me coming up. Yeah. Like, what is that? What is it? What's in that tube? What are you bringing with you? Yeah, you know, poison, poison darts. I didn't know they were poison like at the time. Yeah, no, they're just darts. Yeah, they're no just problem. darts, you know? Yeah. Wow, that, yeah, that's a good picture. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely look like uh, you guys are out there and you're serious, right? Yeah. So who else is in this picture? Put that, put that back up there. Who, who else is up there with you? So the guy immediately to my right with a, the similar hat is named Jeff Tourish, and uh -huh. he was the, the kind of lead force behind the documentary. Okay. And then... The guy behind him is Garrett Cooper, who is the trip leader. Okay. And uh, there was a bunch of other people on the, the team as well. That photo just happened to catch us three. And Jeff had You don't have a video of this, of you guys like in slow motion, like to the Kill Bill music, like dun, dun, dun. No, I wish. And this is a very like zoomed in photo too. Like, I yeah. was scrolling through all the, the trip photos and saw that like out in the corner of like one picture. And I was like, oh, yeah. that's a good one right there. And just blew it up yeah, as big as Too bad as you I don't could. have the slow-mo video. So what was the purpose of the expedition? So as I understood it, I had mentioned that the Explorers Club, so let's start way back. Garrett had made inroads with this tribe because he had been down there and had made a friend. And this is all, if Garrett's watching, I'm trying to remember it the best I can and give all credit possible, but this is just how I remember it. Um, Garrett, through his travels in Colombia and South America, had met a guy named Goran, who was this Serbian uh, expat, now living in Brazil, who, as I heard it, had worked in the Emerald mines or the emerald trade back in like the so 80s like colonel Kurtz, very like an interesting <laughs> guy for sure yeah and he used to like raise jaguars and stuff on his land and yeah. now he runs this like uh tree top hotel okay. and so through his dealings in the jungle he had made contact with this tribe who had first made contact with the outside world officially in 1975 so the story went that in 1975 um a member of their tribe who was completely distraught who loved a girl as they told it but who didn't love him back and was kind of just a general pariah of the village, decided that he was going to go commit suicide by a white man on the riverbank. So a lot of these tribes, as I understand it, who live deep in the interior, like deep in the jungle, it, they actually kind of fled there. So during the big rubber boom at the turn of the century, when all the Europeans were coming down to Brazil for the rubber, they treated the indigenous people horribly, you know, enslaved them, tortured them, killed them, forced them to work on these rubber plantations. And so a lot of these tribes hid, basically, traveled deep into the jungle to hide from enslavement. Hmm. And because of that, they have a really strong oral history about 
the outsiders and the white man, which down in Brazil is like anybody that's not indigenous is white. Okay. Um, and so the narrative that they had is that the white man's going to kill you. So this guy thought he would basically go down to the riverbank where there was a government Funai boat parked and commit suicide by Funai agent. And so he goes down the riverbank waving his hands all crazy like, hey, kill me, kill me. This girl doesn't like me. And instead they invited him onto the boat, gave him a bunch of machetes and like <laughs> nice stuff to take back to the village. And he came back like a big hero. Huh. The problem was- Did he was, get the girl? I don't know. Well, this is where the story oh, gets. This is where yeah, the story okay. gets real sad. Okay. Because they didn't follow proper quarantine procedures, and so uh, there was a huge outbreak of New World illness, and the Matisse lost like ninety percent of their tribal population within like a decade. Wow. And so after that, the government, you know, then they had, uh, you know, had created then formal relations and lines of communication with the government, who was then helping them, you know, trying to help uh, send in doctors and stuff to to help them weather this this. Uh, disease um, that they were encountering, and then also relocated some of their villages um, up the river a ways, which is where they got into this conflict with this other tribe because now their village had been put in the territory of this other tribe. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in this whole mix, Goran, the Serbian who raised jaguars, okay. had gone down to Adelaide de Norte and had made connections with the Matisse tribe who have government housing there where they send their kids to be educated. At some point, he had been invited down to the border of this massive indigenous reserve that still exists. Um, it's, it's, I don't know if it's controversial within Brazil, but it's 11% of the territorial landmass is this indigenous reserve, the Vale do Javari indigenous reserve. Mm -hmm. And only like three to 4,000 people live there. It's these tribal communities. So it's a massive part of the territorial country and it's not filled with very many people. Do we have a picture of this map, Andy? I think we got a picture of that, that territory, right? Yeah. So it's 11% of Brazil, but only like 4,000 people live there? It's really sparse. And this is why it's So is a, this blue border, is this blue border the tribal reserve? That's the tribal reserve. And, and then, you can see the little teepees um, uh -huh. or malokas are, are uh, tribes, tribal communities that have contact um, with the, the government, have some level of official back and forth with them. And then the arrow, uh, the bow and arrow indicators are isolated tribes <laughs> who still have yet to make formal in roads with, with the government. Might as well put it like a big, like, no-go X yeah. over it, right? It, it's a, when they arrow. try and make contact, it's a big deal. Like, they, they, they go to so many lengths to make sure everyone's safe. And it's, yeah. it's the, the tribe that we were so afraid of encountering down there, the Karubo, the April after I got back, they made their first official contact with the government, and it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And they, they have, like, you know, entire professionals and, like, uh, CDC-type teams that go down there and make sure that all the kind of... Uh, you know, every, every disease control thing that they can put into effect is being, is precaution is being taken to protect the people. So they know where these tribes are, but... They have, they have rough ideas. Yeah. So sometimes they move around, and sometimes they send out expeditions, as I understand it, to, to kind of try and get a better sense of where these tribes are at, because it's mm -hmm. kind of like, it's all hearsay. You know, it's people coming back from the interior saying, I encountered this tribe, or I think there's, you know, these people might be living over here. You know, it's all kind of secondhand hearsay knowledge. Right. And it's just because it's such deep jungle and so our deal was is that you are not, outsiders are not allowed into that reserve at all. Supposedly, we didn't go down to the, the, the checkpoint on the river, but suppose there's a military checkpoint there and you are not allowed to go into that reserve, otherwise you're violating some serious international law. So you went pretty deep, but you still didn't go as deep as you can go. Yeah, we went right to the border. So we traveled eight like hours down river. on the border? Yeah, well, on the river. So we went into the jungle and we... We met them right on the border, and the Matisse actually had to travel, as I understand it, a couple days upriver. To come hang out with you guys. To come meet up with us. Yeah. And in return, you know, they knew that there was some cultural study going on, but our team was also bringing down boat motors and machetes and pots and pans. And so they hang out with you guys. Use. Yeah. They give you the dog and pony show. Yeah, they show us, like, I, this is how we hunt monkeys with blowguns, and this is, like, you know, yeah. our, our cultural beliefs, and you can interview us for a while. But that's what it is. But, yeah. And then you give them, like, guns. Yeah. Not guns. Well, they like had guns. Someone technology. gave them guns. Yeah. You give them boat motors and, 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 and uh, you know. Yeah. Which, if you think about it, goods. I imagine gives you a huge advantage on the river. I mean, oh, if you have a motor sure. and can travel up river, that's yeah. a game changer. And you don't beat yourself to death, like, yeah. paddling or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a, so as Garrett made, met Gorin and made inroads with these people, uh, they started to talk out a deal, you know, essentially to that effect that like, well, there might be some researchers who'd be interested in coming down to meet with you and study your culture. 
And you know, like I said, these people are very aware and very transactional, and they want to better their lives and better their situation for their mm -hmm. families. And so they set up these kind of meetings. And uh, the first big one was the Explorers Club one that went down in that February. And they went down to just create kind of a, uh, a written record of some of their oral history, uh, to film that documentary project, to get a general, I guess, canvassing of the different kind of uh, natural herbs and, and plants that they use in their ceremonies. And then the second leg of the trip was going to come back in October to kind of finish up the work from the first. Okay. And that's where there was an opening on the trip. I just, by sheer happenstance and luck of kind of, you know, putting myself out there and asking if I could tag along, was given the opportunity to, to tag along. And then before I know it, I'm on a plane flying into Bogota hmm. to then go into the jungle. That's wild, man. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, on the plane, too, I was reading uh, River of Doubt, which yeah. is about Teddy Roosevelt's expedition. Uh -huh. And they ham it up a bit in that book, but they make it sound like hell on earth. You know, they're, the author's just really chewing the scenery. Just, I'm like, you're entering into this, like, biological, like, hunger games where everything is fighting for survival. And, like, these men didn't realize that they had set foot into this, yeah. you know, uh, Thunderdome. They didn't have boats with motors, though, did they? Who? Teddy Roosevelt. No, yeah, there you <laughs> go. they were going with the current, so we had, a, they yeah. had a leg up. But I'm sitting there on the plane, having never been in a jungle, like other than Hawaii, I guess, reading right. this thing. A little bit different experience. And just like, you know, shaking in my boots a bit, like, oh my gosh, I'm going, I've never met any of these people. I hope they know what they're doing. Like, we're going yeah. into the Amazon jungle. Like, Steve Elkins, my mentor at this club who had gone there, they got a bunch of, like, flesh-eating parasites when they came back out. Cool. I was just saying, like, man, this might have been a big mistake. <laughs> so, yeah. So you, get, you take an eight-hour boat ride up, yeah. up to the, to the um, edge of this uh, reserve, yeah. and, and you meet these people. Yeah. What was it like when you pulled up to, to I, where did you pull up to? Did so, they have a village? So, no, they, so, they, because they, they had traveled. They just said, meet us at this, like, inlet? Yeah, I guess they had agreed on some GPS coordinates okay. um, to meet at. And I think there's a video clip, if you want to play it, of us kind of going down river. Uh, but yeah. we spotted a flag on the riverbank. You'll see it in the video, which was kind of the marker of like, that's where they're at. And uh, coming in to meet them was one of the most surreal experiences of my life because it felt like something out of like a Jungle Cruise ride at Disneyland. And the video we're about to see is the first time that you guys met these people. First time for, yeah. I mean, like I said, Obviously a, a they, lot they, of the they, team been had been down yeah. there and had yeah. met. So for a lot of the people on the team, it was kind of like a reunion. They were okay. seeing people that they'd met before and already had some semi like standing relationship with. Mm -hmm. But for me, this was totally a first and, uh, you know, making my first introduction to the Matisse tribe. All right, let's see it. This is what was rattling around in your head. Yeah, exactly. This is what I'm talking about, <laughs> the dramatic writing that puts the fear of God in you a little bit. That was the other tribe we were talking about. That, that's the marker flag we're looking for, for their camp.
so presumably they're just like hanging out in the jungle somewhere around around there watching you guys like fall out of the boat yeah you know they, they were up on the riverbank and as soon as we got there uh they came down and uh, we were told not to help unload our bags, that they were going to do that for us, and it was like kind of a, an honor dynamic. That was part of the deal. Yeah. yeah, and so they came down. But when we first came across and I saw that boat, like I said, it was so surreal. It felt like something out of a, like a Disney ride, but it was, it was real. You know, I felt like something like was staged there. It's like, we're here. Well, yeah. We're somewhere. And then you look <laughs> up on the ridge line, and you can see them, because you know, they got their campfires going and stuff through the smoke, mm -hmm. kind of standing up there silhouetted against the, uh, the sun. And it was... It was one of those kind of out-of-body experiences almost. And then we come up and are kind of, you know, walking through the camp, and they'd set up a little area for us to set up our, our hammocks, and it was a very, uh, very cool experience. Did they wave? Like, hi? Is that a thing? Yeah, they, they like, came down. I mean, and the thing is, is, like, they, they are... It's such a mixed bag in terms of uh, exposure to the outside world. I mean, all their kids are going to school and learning Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So... They're traditional, and you'll see, you know, later on, talking about like some of the traditional um, uh, jungle skills they have, monkey hunting and stuff like that. I don't know how long that stuff will last because they are, uh, what's the word, um, ingratiating themselves to, to modern Brazil very, very quickly. Yeah, and so you know, it wasn't like that kind of, you know, they, they're they're very much caught to speed about cultural dynamics, and they were very respectful and, and friendly and. Uh, you know, they knew why we were down there, and we knew that they were up there specifically for us. And, you know, there was a nice level of, of, of open expectation of what that week was going to look like. Right. So, so let's talk about some of the activities that they had planned for you. Yeah. They took you on a monkey hunt, huh? Yeah. So the big thing down there, as I understand it, 60 to 70% of their diet is monkey. And they hunt it with uh, Carare dart poison with blowguns. They have these big, you know, 13-foot-long blowguns. Yeah, we've got some. In the club, yeah, right? that's the funny. You come into this club, and we got plenty of, of blowguns. But it's it's one of those things where I like. I think a lot of times it sounds like an exaggerated number, like 13 feet. Uh -huh. But these things towered over these guys, and it was pretty remarkable to see them maneuver through the jungle with these things on their shoulder. And they tilted in such a way that it never got caught in any, uh, you know, of the brush or anything like that. They could move through real quick. But each man in the tribe is responsible for making his own blowgun, making his own dart poison. And they took us through the whole process of how they, they literally render this stuff down from vines. And it's this whole big pseudo-technical, pseudo-spiritual process. Uh, you know, there's some prayers that are uttered over the, uh, the dart poison as it's being made. And then they end with this, like, sticky black tar substance that they paint all their darts with. And then they take off into the jungle. We, we were, it was tough keeping up with them. I mean, these guys were booking it. Even when they've got the 13-foot blowgun on their shoulder. Yeah, barefoot. No fear at all. The whole time there, I was checking over every single log. I was worried I was going to, you know, step onto a snake or something like that. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, the floor there, anybody who's been in the jungle knows that, like, the floor is just mulch in a lot of places. Right. You think it's a big log you're about to step into, and your foot just goes right through it. And so we're carefully kind of, like, plodding our way through, and they're just booking it, and they're calling out to each other in the middle of the jungle. I never saw a single monkey in a tree. They saw all the monkeys in the trees, and they'd kind of, you know, stop, get very quiet, point one out. One guy would very carefully take a dart. They'd put this kind of uh, cotton fiber substance, which they'd lick in and put to create a seal in the gun, put it in, level it out, and it just, and you'd see the thing arc. And all of a sudden, in some cases, you know, after a couple, the poison acted really quick. It causes respiratory failure in the monkeys. Mm -hmm. Either the monkey would come tumbling out of the tree and land on the, the jungle floor. One dart. One dart. And how, how much did this monkey weigh? Some of them, I don't know, I, I never picked one up, but they were pretty, pretty sizable monkeys. Um, this is a monkey on a guy's back. Yeah, and these were some of the smaller ones they were picking up. So they he's, picked up he some... It looks like he's got a couple darts in him. Would they hit him a couple times? I don't know what... I think that might be part of the, uh, the reed that's tied off around their okay. necks. Because usually when they would... They'd take the dart out, and they'd kind of have a, a contest between the guys to see where they hit him. It was kind of a, a point of pride to see who got the best shot on their But on their they're monkey. hitting the, a monkey with multiple darts? No, usually just one. Just one. One will do it. And, and then how in some long cases, would it take from the fall out of the tree? Minutes. And in some cases, they would, they would fall on the branch. You know, they, they wouldn't fall all the way out, or they'd just kind of slump over. And then you'd see these guys who would climb 40 feet vertically up a tree huh. to haul this monkey down. They'd throw it down, and, uh, you know, they'd tie some, some reeds around it, as like, or some uh, 
you know, kind of like straps, and the kids would basically throw it on almost like a backpack and start walking it back to their camp. Huh. And uh, I think I have a video of the monkey hunt, too, and them rendering down the, the Carrare. Uh, so so what, um, what was the dark poison made out of? It's all vine. So you'll see if, if vine. we... Vine. Yeah. It's if not, we, yeah. It's, it's all a vine that they... I don't know how, who first figured it out in the first place, but a lot of uh, indigenous tribes down there use similar uh, Carrare poison. Uh-huh. Um, what video was the monkey hut? Video two or three? Uh, it should be video four. Video four. Okay. But it shows the whole process. Like I said, whoever first figured it out is a genius because I don't know how you can take this vine off this tree and figure out, oh, if we distill take it through it all whatever. these steps, it becomes this really potent poison yeah. that we can then put on a dart that we shoot through a tube and start sniping monkeys out of trees huh. from 40 feet away. <laughs> all right, let's watch this video. I think the video starts with us, our first uh, evening meeting with the tribe, too, so you can kind of see the, our first sit-down with them. And they're speaking, the language they speak is a, a Panoan dialect. So we had a translator there who would translate the Panoan into Portuguese, which would then be translated again for us into English. Hmm. So there were several layers of, of translation there. Nice hammock setup. Yeah. They made a little table area for us too, which is very nice. Oh, I forgot. At the beginning here, they might be. There might be at the beginning here a demonstration of some of the, the traps that they would lay around their camp for like human intruders. They had some that are designed to catch like pigs. Yeah. Because they, they eat jungle pig too. But they also have some like uh, trip wires for people that might wander into their camp that they don't want wandering in. <laughs> so this spear would just come flying at you right in your gut, I guess, if you trip it. that make your tongue tingle or something? It didn't do anything. Uh, it was uh, the most bizarre thing. So you could hear them uttering blessings over the, the, the vine as they were kind of scraping it on kind of like a cheese grater made out of monkey teeth. Hmm. That's the good stuff. That's what you don't want to get poked with. Oh, someone stepped on a stick. He got pissed off. That was probably me. <laughs> he just throws his blowgun on the ground. He's like, got it. Yeah. It's like a mic drop. It's like yeah, an yeah. Amazonian mic drop right there. So he's as I'm climbing the tree to, to pull the monkey down.
And in this case, sometimes they pull it down, and the, there's a baby monkey. And this one they adopted. They let the kid, the kids play with it. And it just, for the rest of the time we were there, they had this thing wrapped up in a towel around their camp. It's kind of sad. It is, yeah, I guess. But it, at least it you know, didn't become dinner like its mom. But it had to watch. Yeah. <laughs> well, it fell out of the tree. It was hanging on the mom's back, and all of a sudden the mom takes a tumble out of the tree. Bad day. Bad, Bad day, day for that for little monkey. baby monkey. Yeah. Man, that's, that's some hardcore food chain shit right there. Yeah. Because if you think about like our separation between us and monkeys, yeah. it's not like the separation between us and chickens, right? Yeah. Like chickens barely know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> monkeys are very, very aware of what's going on around them, right? It's, I mean, yeah, that, I think you saw a little bit of the, the, the little baby crying. Yeah. That baby was distraught for sure. That baby yeah. definitely knew something horrible had happened to its mom. That's rough. And then all the and then one of the, the matriarchs of the tribe picked the little baby monkey up, sat with it for a minute, picked all the little fleas or bugs off of it, and then just plopped it in one of the little girl's heads, and then it just became a pet for them. For how long? I don't know. Until they eat it? It could still be a pet. I have no clue. I don't know what happened to that baby monkey. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I have heard about some tribes that do adopt pets. Yeah. And they're like not food anymore. Like yeah. when they become the the pet. They're not food. Well, from what, to that point. from what I heard, they did have a very defined diet. Like, for example, you know, we'd asked them a lot about other types of animals they hunted and other things they ate. And uh, we asked about jaguars. If they had any encounters with jaguars. And they had, but they never ate any part of the jaguar. So every once in a while, they'd come across one and they'd kill it or it would be causing them problems and they'd kill it, whatever it may be. Um, but you'd think that that'd be like a clear source of meat, you know, a big animal that you could, mm -hmm. you know, cook up and... It just wasn't in their diet, so they hmm. didn't. They didn't use. From what they told us, they didn't use the fur. They didn't use the skin. They didn't eat the meat. It was just kind of a nuisance. Interesting. Yeah. What else did they eat besides monkey? So as I understood, they uh, they were, were foragers as well. So as we were going out on this uh, this hunt, um, the women would kind of come behind and they were picking some stuff off off trees and vines and stuff like that, different types of fruits and and whatnot. And then they also do fish. And from what we heard, they, they do the jungle pigs, too, which they hunt with by arrow. And they also have shotguns that they hunt with now, too. Um, so the, the old ways are starting to, to slip. I mean, obviously, yeah. they were still very skilled hunting with the blowguns, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, within several generations, it's primarily shotguns that they use. Right. And then we had heard that there might be some agriculture back in their village, but we weren't sure. Basically, just the cultivated whatever's growing. Yeah, maybe transplant some stuff or yeah, but I think primarily it's still hunter gatherers uh -huh. is the primary uh, primarily where their diet comes from. Huh. Yeah, and I had a little bit of the monkey. I had a little bit of the monkey rib cage. Yeah, it was real chewy. Did it taste good? <laughs> no, I can't but, say. I can't was say. Was it weird I'm, that you were basically eating a, a a person, but you know, like a couple couple strands of DNA off? <laughs> yeah, well, on the on the little like cutting block where this monkey rib cage was was like a little hand curled up. And I was told that like, you're not supposed to mess with monkey brains, that that's like you can get prions or like dangerous uh -huh. proteins. It's too similar. So I thought I was safe. I would keep it safe by just Did they eat the monkey brains? I don't know. I didn't see it. I don't know. Uh, I would assume not, but I... It's an Indiana Jones thing, right? But maybe that's BS. Yeah. That, I, that was the worst of the Indiana Jones movies in terms of like, you know... That was, yeah. Stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have no clue. I... They might, but I would also think that, you know, they you know, have all kinds of ancestral knowledge that maybe they also figured out that that's not a, you know. Well, I did see, um, and I had some photos, when they were done boiling up the monkey, they did have the skull left over. Uh -huh. and the skull was intact. So unless they cracked that thing open, I think they're mostly just going for arms, rib meat, right, um, and whatnot. And it's kind of like, jer at least once it's been boiled for a long time, yeah. it's real tough meat. It's not the most savory fall no off the flavor. Bone. Like, I, no, there was no seasonings on the piece I had. It was just like fresh out of the boiling pot, and like so, just boiled, boiled monkey meat. No, like no herbs. No. Yeah. And so, for the most part, we were eating fish. You know, we we had some like fish that we had caught down by the river, and that's what we were sticking to for the most part. Uh, for did the, you bring some seasoning to put on the fish? We did bring some seasoning down. Yeah. So our fish, we, we we were not suffering food wise. Yeah. For some nice. Uh, you know, some nice lunches and dinners. That's the key if you're really in the back country is you, you get the little seasoning kit. Yeah. You know, so when the food sucks, you're like, oh, put some, put some Just spice some on salt that. on it. Put some Tony, Tony Satchers or whatever 
whatever your poison is. And well, yeah. the, the one funny you reminded me now. There was one funny guy. So we kept our camps apart, uh, like a respectful level. Uh huh. Um, so we wouldn't really be into their business, especially in the early mornings and night. They wouldn't be into our business. And then during the middle of the day, we kind of group up okay. and occasionally go out on jungle walks or hunts together. Uh, but there was one guy who was very curious. And this goes back to like just the wild nature of, of what this place is like. So his mom had been a Karubo, the other tribe, and his mom had been kidnapped when she was pregnant with him by the Matisse. And so now he's full blood Karubo, but raised Matisse. Huh. And a lot of these tribes, that's what they do. They, a lot of kidnappings happen for keeping genetic diversity within the tribe. So it's like a known practice. Huh. But he would keep coming down to our camp and we had some like checks mix there. And that guy loved the Chex Mix. <laughs> I guess he was getting tired of monkey or something like that. It's delicious. He'd, he'd come down and just post up by our little camp table and just open up the Chex Mix and just house the stuff all afternoon. I mean, it's salty, right? Yeah. It's salty carb. Everybody loves that. Yeah. You know, you, bright, you bring, made me think. So with, with the camp, I noticed all you guys had head, headlamps on. What did they think of the headlamps? Well, they, they have a lot of that stuff themselves. Really? Yeah. So they're starting, like I said, they're, um, it's, it was always a weird mix about, you know, uh, how much they were putting on as a show for us. Like, I don't know if that's how they dress in their village. You know, if, if they wear more clothes when they're back yeah. in their village. I think realistically they probably do because they know that they're the kind of the native trappings have value. And that's kind of what the, the cultural anthropologists or documentarians or whoever you want to see. Looking for. Yeah. So they kind of play up that. I mean, they can't fake the jungle skills. The fact that they're making the poison and stuff. That's what like comforted me. Like, oh well, this is legit because yeah. you. Can't I just saw that monkey fall out of the tree. Yeah, so you can't fake real. that. And this yeah. guy just climbed forty feet up in the air to grab him. Um, but you know they have. You know, like I said, one of the big deals that they have when they come to do these meetings is they're getting all kinds of stuff like that: headlamps, cook stoves, uh, boat motors. Yeah. Very transactional. I mean, it's. I, I don't think it's skipping too far ahead. But you know, on that note, when we had our final kind of sit down around the campfire our last night there, we were talking about the experience of the week and kind of what they wanted moving forward. And they were like, we enjoyed meeting you all. Next time, we'd like an aluminum boat. Oh. So they're very aware of uh, what's working for them, what's not. They realize that the, the wood boats are falling apart, that the boat yeah. motors are falling apart. So they want an aluminum boat the next time there's a meeting. Yeah, I mean, freedom of movement is huge. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. You well, and even even having the stoves. So they had these portable gas stoves, which is another thing they got. And apparently that was big time because before, especially with some of these hostile tribes in the area, making camp at night was a big ordeal. Mm -hmm. They had to go ashore, find a place to camp, send guys out to clear, you know, the way. I don't know if they were setting traps in the night or posting sentries or whatever, but it was a big ordeal to make camp for the night. And then as soon as they had the portable stove that they could cook with while on their boats with their boat motors, yeah, they could travel overnight. Or just not just throw up a bunch of smoke. You know, a portable stove yeah. isn't a campfire. Campfire you can see for yeah. a long way away. Yeah. So um, all this stuff is just like, you know, they, they're very aware of like what, if, if something works, they're going to use it. Yeah. Like when we went out and the next, the next section we'll get into is some of the ritual practices that they put us through. But one of those was finding the uh, Goliath tree frogs. And they all had headlamps to find those frogs. Yeah, they weren't too proud to use a headlamp so to search around. So you got, you, you got to do some drugs. They gave you drugs. Yeah, well, it's a medicinal ceremony. Oh, okay. Purely medicinal, not okay. hallucinogenic. It just makes you feel horrible. But So it's not fun drugs? No, it's not fun drugs. Because I think most people think that if you're licking a frog or something, you're going to... You'll see some stuff. Yeah. No, this so, just makes you poop your pants. <laughs> so tell, tell me about that. What, uh, what's the point of this ceremony? So they, you know, part of the study there was kind of doing a, a canvassing of their, their, their traditions and their oral history and, and kind of uh, the different rituals that they practice. And so they ran us through the gauntlet, I think, to their amusement because a lot of them are painful. Uh -huh. And they're very self-aware about that they're painful. And uh, in some cases, there's, that's the only reason they exist is they're just painful for the sake of being painful. Hmm. There's no greater, deeper spiritual meaning. And so they had a lot of fun just kind of running us through our paces and so some of the rituals include, and I think I have some pictures of some of them. Uh, this one I think that Andy's got queued up is the ritual tattooing. Okay. Which they did with uh, tree thorns and a, a kind of ink that they rendered down from tree sap. So as we go on our jungle walks, they'd hack this big black chunk of tree sap off a tree, render it down, and then poke you with thorns and, and rub the ink in. And we're, 
you know, again, from our translations, what we were getting, there was no real greater meaning to it spiritually than just a marker of how much pain you could put up with. So the bigger tattoo you got, the more lines people had on their, because they would get on their face. Okay. We were getting it on our arms and shoulders and stuff like that. But they would get it on their face. And the more lines you had on your face, kind of the, the cue was, yeah, the more badass you were. So what did they think about your, 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 your bro that had the giant compass tattoo on his back? I don't, that's a good that's question. A, that's a lot of surface area. They yeah. must have appreciated the surface area. Yeah, well, especially that. if they don't know. I mean, and I've never had a, a tattoo that wasn't done by Thorn and like trees. Yeah. So I don't know what that feels like. I would imagine it feels a bit more, a bit less rough than. Yeah. So but sharper maybe, needles, better, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe they thought he was just like a super badass. So like, yeah. If you show up there with a full back piece. Did they like, say Damn. anything about it? Did they, no. did they comment on his tattoo? But he'd been down there before multiple times. Okay. So maybe they'd already gotten past that. Yeah. But I know that the one matriarch of the tribe who I mentioned before, who was clearly kind of the boss down there, uh -huh. she had more lines than anybody on her cheeks. Her really? cheeks were just laid out with line after line. So this is, this is a picture of, um, what's this guy doing here? Oh, so this oh, goes back. to himself. Yeah, well, this is, this is a, a, a segue kind of, but this goes back to when we were talking about other stuff we were eating there. Uh -huh. And uh, so this guy, uh, he and Jeff are both former military, and they're both uh, wilderness EMTs. Okay. So that's part of what they do for a living is they train people and, and they love wilderness medical skills. So they had the, the fun idea that they were going to try and fish for piranha with human blood and see how effective it was. So they just put in human blood in a Dasani bottle? Yeah. Well, they bought the needles in advance. So they okay. prepped for this. And they got down there. And one afternoon, we were just kind of hanging around the camp. They're like, all right, let's do it. And they filled up a, a water bottle, 12-liter water bottle, or not a 12-ounce 12, uh, 12 water bottle, um, probably about halfway. Yeah. with Garrett's blood, and we went down to the river, and he just started dumping it onto some branches. Did this work? No, not at all. We you didn't were, catch we, any piranha. Well, we did catch piranha. We but, were hoping that it was going to be like a swarm, like in the movie. You know, they were going to start frothing and like right. slapping around. Like on the Jungle Cruise. Like on Everybody the Jungle knows. Cruise. Yeah, yeah, which is my, you know, the main research I did. Yeah. <laughs> and instead, we got these like really horrible little like mud uh, bottom feeding like catfish with these uh -huh. spines that came up and seemed kind of interested in it. And so we were pulling that, and our, our fishing rods, we had some hooks, but like it was literally like a piece of line tied to a stick, like yeah. a reed. And so we'd flick these things back up onto the boat, these little mud catfish. One guy would break the spines off, and they handed it to me to like finish the thing off. Mm -hmm. But I didn't come well prepared in a lot of ways, but I also didn't have a knife there to finish these fish. So I'm trying to knock these guys' things against the, the like, uh, seat on the boat uh -huh. to put them out of their misery. And these things are like tough horrible little fish. Catfish, right? Yeah. It was rough finishing these things off. And then finally, we were able to, to cut them up into pieces and use them then as bait for the piranha. Ah. And the piranha like them. So we were able to pull up some piranha, and we had some piranha soup one night. Uh, it was pretty good? It was okay. Oh, uh, this That looks delicious. You didn't make that in the jungle. I didn't make it. Where did that plate come from? Yeah, we brought, yeah, we brought our, our nice little dishware in. Um, did the, you for real? Yeah. So, like I mean, I said, people do, you know? full-on Teddy Roosevelt expedition here. Kind of. I mean, I, I'm not kidding. Like, the Matisse, they really did. They went out of their way. They cleared the campsite for us. You know, we didn't have to hack through any bush to where we were going to, like, hang our hammocks. Yeah. They had built a little kitchen area for us before we'd even got down there. And then we had local fixers on the trip that were going to be doing all the cooking and, and food prep. And because we came down in a motorboat, there were just, you know, big ice chests filled with vegetables, fruit juices. So we were, you know, we were in the jungle, but we were also... Right living pretty pretty well, nice. all things considered. Yeah. And so they made up that little piranha soup. And th there wasn't too much meat on the bones, and it's that kind of fish where it's like, as much as you try, you're not going to catch all the little bones. Yeah. So you're picking stuff out of your teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still a pretty cool experience eating prawn on the banks of the and Amazon. And what, what is that garnished with? I, I noticed that there's a garnish on this particular dish. That's just fancy. That's just decoration. We brought down the fancy dishware. Yeah. So it's just that's just like printed on the, the bowl. Oh, okay. I thought it was like some sort of... No, that's, that's pretty Something much that just a piranha, a piranha stuck in some broth. So it wasn't too fancy. Yeah. But, yeah, that was, that was you know, what we would do at nights. And, uh, so let's get back to the rituals and the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the, the different rituals they would do, um, one of them was called the Marowene ritual, which is where they wear this red clay mask. And it's purely just about uh, pain. Like it's just to see how tough. How so many, this is the red mask, terrifying. This is the red mask, yeah. And so... The ritual would start is one of the, the Matisse would disappear, paint himself up in mud, and then kind of come slinking out of the jungle as this embodying the spirit, the Marowene spirit. Okay. And 
then traditionally they'd line up kids, women, anyone from the, the village and whip them with these reeds just to teach them to be tough. And so they came down and they had all the reeds and we'd go stand out in front of them and you know, they had like a little post that they'd planted so you could like put your hands on it and they'd just whip you across the back. And the point was just to act like it didn't hurt at all. You know, just be like, nice. You like, did that? Thank you. Yeah, everyone did it. It was How like, many did you take? I took two, but like they'll take like 50. So we got Whoa. off easy. Um, How bad did it hurt? I, they didn't get me too good. You think they were pulling punches? Probably a little bit. They were all laughing and giggling at us. But one guy got hit real, but I, I have a picture did you there. See, did you see them hitting each other? Like, did you see how hard they were hitting each other? No, we did not see that. I wonder what that would look like if they went harder on I each wonder, other. too. You said 50. How do you know they took 50 lashes? Just from what uh, Dave said and other people have asked. But they didn't, like, have scars on their back, right? No, no. I mean, you can see uh, there's a, a picture of yeah. a guy who got lashed real bad. And it leaves a significant mark, but generally it didn't draw blood unless it was, like, really a stinger and got you. Mm -hmm. So it would just kind of leave that raised welt, and then it would go away. Did they like this guy? I, maybe not. I don't, know. I don't know. Or maybe they liked him more. I don't know. It's hard Better to tell. Better rapport, worse rapport. He was kind of the jerk on the trip. Maybe it was no, he was, he was this, this that French... He, that, that maybe he gets it worse. No, he was... Maybe the fact that... So they, they, they whip you kind of from like a crouch a little bit. And so uh -huh. he's a bit shorter. But he was this very friendly French-Canadian guy. Oh, yeah? So I don't know if just the leverage just lined up just right. But he got whipped real bad. Do you have a video of this? I have a video of all the rituals. So when I'm done, uh, and I'll lay out the other ones, and you can kind of see. So there was that one. There was another one that's for hunting called Bashite, which is another root that they grind up, and they actually put it in your eyes. Uh -huh. And it's supposed to help you see, uh -huh. uh, see better when you're hunting. And it burns. And uh, they've actually done some science on it that it does something to your ocular nerve. So suppose there is some science behind it that actually does open up your range of, I guess, colors or something for a short time. Um, but you'll see in the video, you put it in your eyes, and then you're supposed to recite the names of the fastest creatures in the jungle. Well, you kind of like rub your joints and stuff, and it's supposed to make you faster and, okay. and a better hunter. And then, uh, so we got the tattooing, the marrowine spirit, the bashita in the eyes, and then the big one was the, the cambo, frog poison ceremony. Okay. And the irony of all this is you can actually get this done to yourself in L.A. if you wanted to. Like, it spread so far oh, and wide. Oh, we imported it? <laughs> yeah. We get the best stuff in L.A. Yeah. So if you wanted yeah. to go get frog poison, you know, you could probably set up an appointment. So you know, sometime what does the frog poison do? And, and it's frog poison. They don't use it for darts or anything, right? No. So this is, and everything that they did was very gendered. So the men dealt with everything that had to do with the dart poison. Okay. Women didn't do that. That was all, and each man did it for himself. They didn't help each other. It was kind of like a rite of passage, I guess. The harvesting of the frog poison, the men found the frogs, but in terms of harvesting the frog poison... That was all the women doing it. And so I had heard from the past trip that had gone out that this was part of their, their ritual ceremonies and researched it a bit and was a little bit nervous to be undergoing this thing because I knew it was going to come up and I didn't want to, to wimp out about it. Right. But from the medical readings that the wilderness EMTs were getting, the first time they'd gone down there, they basically said that it sends your body into like a mild form of shock. Okay. And some people can have really aggressive reactions to that. Some people less so. Um, but essentially they see it as like a cleansing ritual that uh, they capture these frogs, these Goliath tree frogs, they bind them by their wrists and ankles and stretch them over hot coals. And the stress that it induces in the frogs causes them to secrete this poisonous mucus from their skin. The women then gather the mucus, put it off to the side somewhere, take a couple hot reeds that they heat up to their glowing red, burn you on your arm, pick the blisters, and then put the frog poison onto the exposed blisters, which in very short order causes your heart rate just to go get jacked. You start to sweat. You feel nauseous. You feel like you need to throw up. You feel like you need to, you know, empty your bowels. Like, whatever you got to do, you just, you're like, something is going very wrong inside me, and I need to just vacate everything now. Huh. And then after 30 minutes, they wash it off, and supposedly you feel a lot better and cleansed afterwards. So now, how, how, many, how many do you do? You do like one dot or two dots? or We did two. They came around. I was so scared going up, and you'll see from the video, because um, one of the guys had a bad reaction and uh, right after they put it on me. And so they came around and offered a second dosage, and I was like, I'm good, thank how you. How many dosages do these guys take? Uh, I don't know. I know that people that do it recreationally, because it is a big thing now. It's been exported all over the world as like a healing ceremony. Okay. There are some people that go hardcore with it, and they'll do like four at a time six at a time. Huh. I don't know if they 
I didn't get the sense from them down there that they go that crazy with it, uh, that it is more that, you know, it's kind of a special occasion type thing and that they would do, you know, one or two. But again, it was mostly for our benefit to see how they did it. But you can see all up and down their arms, the scars, because it leaves scars of, of where the blisters have been. Huh. And I think they did it to one of the kids when we were there, um, one of the up and coming uh, little boys, he had some. So who participates? Is it men and women that participate? I believe so. that's a good question. I believe so. I think it's the women that harvest it, but I think anyone can participate in the ceremony. Um, but at the time when we were there, only men did it. But most of our, our group was men. And uh, like I said, I think the only one from their village who did it was the little boy. But I could be remembering that wrong. So did they have any fun drugs whatsoever? Uh, not that they showed us. Like was, they didn't have any like wine stuff. that they that they mold, made wine in like a no. stump or... We, we brought down our own uh, rum, and uh, one of the guides was making this rum mix every night called Chichawasa. Uh-huh. And he'd come around in the middle of our, like, we'd be, you know, deep in some, like, cultural interview trying to understand, you know, this, this you ask a question that's been translated twice and then write down an answer that's been translated twice. And he's coming tapping on the shoulder like, do you want some Chichawasa? <laughs> he's like, yeah. And he was just he, very liberal with the thermos of Chichawasa. So we, <laughs> we had our own stuff. And, but but, uh, the, but the, the indigenous tribes down there, they don't have anything like that. They don't have any alcohol, which is surprising, right? I don't know. They might, they might have something like that back in their village where they can like ferment it um, from what we said. But like I said, at nighttime, we'd kind of go our separate ways. Yeah. So they could have been drinking back at their, their village at night, but a lot of our meal times and kind of the more intimate family dynamic times, we were separate from each other. Interesting. So I have no clue if they had brought their own stuff, but we had our own stuff. (laughs) So when you guys went to do the ceremony, you had a couple of wilderness EMTs. Yeah. What was their contingency? What was the out? Like if someone had a really bad reaction, I don't, like did they have question. like did they have like some other drugs that they could give you? You know, like the um, you know the Pulp Fiction yeah some adrenaline needle. shot or something. <laughs> they could. I don't know. I, did they have anything? Did they talk about that? They like oh, don't worry about it. We got you, bro. Like if, well, if they, something they, bad happens, we've got like some pure adrenaline or whatever. They that both we can give strongly you. advised against doing it. The wilderness EMTs did. Yeah, just purely on the basis of what it was. They were like, well, realistically, you know, we're eight hours downriver, right. far away from any help, and like you're putting a foreign substance, you're exposing your body to a foreign substance that we know induces some level of shock. Did these guys do it? One of the guys, Garrett, the trip leader, had done it the time before, but was not doing it again. Okay. Which did not bode well. Okay. And so it became the same, like, well, they're going to do it. What about the other EMT? No, he didn't do it either. <laughs> so it was just a bunch of us, like, it was... Myself, a couple of the, uh, the translators, Goran, yeah. who he did like four of them, so he does it all the time. Um, the Serbian uh, fixer. <laughs> yeah, the Serbian guy's just totally into it. He was totally cool with it. And then he had a friend from Montenegro, this big bearded guy, looks like a Viking, who was down uh-huh. there with us, and he did it with us. And, so, and then a, another guy, so it was a hodgepodge of all of us sitting on a log together, just like sweating and just like, you know. So we ready to roll that footage now? Yeah, now let's, we, let's we roll the footage. I'll let's give you roll enough, that enough uh, lead up to what, for what to expect. So it's kind of an oral history session. We had a lot of those where we're trying to jot down kind of their, their beliefs and their history.
Yeah, just, just gone, just boop. So, so with the frogs, we went out in a, uh, a late night excursion to find the frogs, because I guess they're nocturnal. And it, it was one of those, the night times around the campfire where that was the scariest time for me in the jungle, because it's uh-huh. nighttime in the jungle. And the guys used to mess with me and tell us that this tribe was gonna come down and like, that they'd seen tracks on the riverbank, this other hostile tribe. Yeah. And so we'd just sit around and, and drink until like you weren't scared anymore. <laughs> and then you'd stumble back to your hammock and like just fall asleep and, and try and sleep through the night. And this night I was excited because like we got out of bed at like 4 a.m. when it's still dark. It's like, okay, we can just get out and like go out and do a, do a jungle walk. And they were looking for these frogs. And uh, they're just going around going like wop, 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 like trying to make frog noises right. to get the frogs like talk back to them. And they found them somehow. They climbed a tree and come down with a frog on a stick. And these frogs were not bothered at all. Like, they didn't try and run or anything. And I asked one of the translators, I said, what's this frog's deal? Like, they're cool with, like, lights being sh- shown in its face, and it's just sitting on the edge of this stick, and they put it in this little tree by their camp, and it's not going to go anywhere. And he said, these frogs are so poisonous that they're literally not afraid of anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so then they, come, they tie them up, and these, these frogs got pretty messed up, all things right. considered, once they had been over those coals. Like, once they took them off the little rack that they were on yeah. to collect the poison, those things just kind of curled up for a couple hours. And then finally, I guess, regained their senses enough to kind of hop off into the brush. Um, but they put it on us. And I was, you know, like I said, I was real nervous about doing the ceremony to begin yeah, with. this wasn't the scariest thing? That, that... Well, the guy passing out. So they're coming down the line and putting it on us one by one. Uh-huh. And they had just put mine on. Uh-huh. And everybody else seemed to be doing okay. They just put mine on. I hadn't started feeling the effects yet. And all of a sudden, I looked down the log, and this guy is just like swaying and just goes straight back. And it's just this moment of like, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> what like, were you what were you thinking? Were you like, I'm gonna die? I thought I was I was like, oh no. Like I just put this stuff on me, like I'm next. Like I'm gonna start feeling this. And then but luckily, like I think before it really set in for anybody to be worried, he kind of popped back up again. Almost like it had been a joke. Like the fall did not look like a joke. And afterwards we asked him, and he's like, No, I blacked out. Like I didn't even know what happened. But all of a sudden he was like on his back, kind of like convulsing a little bit, and then he kind of just all of a sudden like before the EMTs, they kind of like stopped him, like, what just happened? Like, get that off him. He popped back awake, like he was fine. Huh. And the guy's sense of humor, we, we you know, thought maybe he was hamming it up or joking or something, so they washed it off of him. And I, I relaxed a bit to just kind of ride out the rest of the, the ceremony. But That's afterwards, crazy. I don't know if I'd do that again, because watching that guy faint like that in the middle of the jungle. And like we had that little like global rescue thing. You know, you sign up anytime you travel abroad. Right. You get some travelers and search, like, we'll send a helicopter to save you. And I was thinking, like, yeah, unless you do drugs, probably. Yeah, or like, or you're in the middle of the Amazon jungle. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm gonna make a call with my Garmin and be like, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is where I'm at. Can you send that helicopter we talked about? Yeah, like, well, let's see, eight hours by boat. What's the boat doing? The boat's probably doing 20 miles an hour, right? Yeah. So to be fair, a helicopter would get down there much, much quicker. Yeah. And the crazy thing was, is on our last night there, we were having this big kind of roundtable discussion. We heard a helicopter fly over, and it was the first time we'd heard anything like that in like the whole week and we kind of like what what was that and we found out that it was the night before the brazilian presidential election uh-huh. with bolsonaro who's been very aggressive with wanting to shut down the indigenous reserve that was like one of his main campaign points was to open those up for what commercial prospects the helicopter was flying out ballot boxes to all the indigenous villages in the interior huh. so they could still vote including the matisse and the matisse a huge portion of their people six families was there with us instead of at their village where they could vote. Uh oh. So and then the next day, you know, I'm sure they, I'm sure they got their votes counted. I hope so. I, I don't know if there's some absentee system or something. But well, I don't know. They, you know, I imagine they drop a bo- ballot box down via helicopter. Do you think there's like an election teller that goes down with it? <laughs> I don't know. And like checks signatures. Dude, these are the mysteries. I'm pretty of the sure Wild this West. is more of a vote by mail thing, and Honor they drop system. off. They're like, oh, that tribe's got 20 people in it, and they drop off 20 ballots, and I yeah. think that's the end of it, right? Yeah. Well, I, I hope they, they got their say because, I mean, regardless, Bolsonaro got elected. And I know since before the whole coronavirus thing hit, I know that they were having some, some tough times down there with a lot more logging activity, a lot more commercial interest coming mm-hmm. down, and starting to kind of, 
you know, again, push those tribes out and uh, a lot of tension. So I was really glad that I got to go down there and experience um, that tribe and their culture while I could, because I think realistically looking at what the situation is down there and just, I mean, we look at the, the odds, you know, of, of 4,000 people occupying that much territory right. and it being so resource rich. How it's long a, can It's that a horrible last thing, but like they cannot logistically hold out. Yeah. If the government does not support them and if the government's actually actively working against that, it's, it's going to happen before you know it. And so I think I'm, I feel very lucky that I got to see some of those traditional rituals. And uh, I know the Matisse will endure. They'll survive. But they'll probably become more and more integrated into right. standard Brazilian um, society, you know, with those same kind of government housing. And, and uh, it was interesting, you know, going into town afterwards and meeting some of the, the Matisse that live in town, you could see a distinct difference between them and the older generation that still come from the villages. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they still had some of the adornments, but it was much more uh, conservative. You know, instead of having the big, uh, the big shells, they have these smaller kind of plugs. And their hairstyles were different, and the way they wore their stuff was different. And you can see that the young people want to be, at least generally, seem like they want to be part of the modern world. You know, they don't want to be fully cut off from everything and, and you know, practicing all these traditional rituals. So it's just, you know, it's, it's the story of all culture, all civilization. It's all in this kind of upward swing towards modernity. We're just all going to be vanilla at some point, right? Just everybody, like, very much the same. I, maybe. But at least for now, I'm comfortable that, like, you know, and that's the whole point of this club. The adventure is still out there. And that's pretty amazing that you got to see that, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I feel like I, I definitely got a window into a, uh, a, a timeless part of human history. And I think, you know, the exciting thing is, you know, like I said, being part of this club is I don't know how long that window is going to stay open, but if you look for it, it's still out there. You can still find it. Um, and uh, you just got to look. Wow. Yeah. All right, you ready to take some questions from the chat here? Let's take some questions. All right, Andy, what do we have in the chat? In the chat tonight, first I want to say hello, beautiful people. It's so wonderful to see your smiling faces once again. First question comes from Larry Stern, and Larry wants to know, did you give away any of your art, or did you keep some of it? So I didn't give away any art, but we do have plans Garrett was supposed to go back down there. And like I said, the big takeaway um, from that trip is they want to do more trips. You know, they've even started to plan that they might have like a village that they could build up river where they would send tribe members to do these kind of rituals for people that want to come see. A little rotation. Yeah. So they're yeah. very, they're very savvy about, you know, marketing this uh-huh. to people. Um, so at the time, uh, I didn't give them any art, but that's because the plan was that Garrett was going to go back. And so those plans were derailed by the whole virus, but when that's done and he can go back, I do want to send a bunch of laminated copies um, that will endure the conditions. Because the, again, the paper I had was fine for for that time I was down there, but it would fall apart pretty quickly. If it was I wonder just, if you could print it on some sort of waterproof stock, because lamination just um, delaminates. That's a good point too. You know what I mean? I bet there's some good printer paper. Maybe yeah. like maybe like a printing service could do it. That's yeah. just like you know that bulletproof stuff. Probably, and and but I do. That is my intention: is to make sure that that art yeah. gets back to them because they had asked. They said, you know, can we keep some of this stuff? And at the time, you know, realistically, I could I could feel the paper starting to like yeah. get, get weak in my hands as I was yeah. drawing on it. So you know, I I, I made that uh, commitment that I would try and send it back in some way, and hopefully, when Garrett goes back down, we that can would send be some super art with cool. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would be cool to think that you have a sketch hanging in some forbidden village yeah. in the middle of the Amazon <laughs> yeah. or something like that. So You print your picture on the back. Yeah. Just, you know, because everybody's a little egotistical around this club, right? Put a little, you know, you know signature. You, you did a nice big, big big picture. You know, you just put that, put that good Indiana Jones picture of you on the back, be like, from your friend Alec. Yeah, and I'll put an Adventurous Club sticker. Yeah. There we nice. go. All right, next question, please. Speaking of the Adventurous Club, Next question comes from Larry Stern. Larry, thank you for both the questions tonight. Would Alec like to explain the significance of carrying our expedition flag as opposed to simply carrying our own personal member flags? That's a great question. You know, the expedition flag, if if you've ever been to the club, we have a lot of expedition flags on display, and it is a great tradition. So why don't you explain how how you got that flag and, and what kind of honor that is? Sure. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, you know, uh, the club does give out expedition flags. You have to apply. There's a whole application process and a whole committee that reviews it. Um, and then if I think, you know, it, it's 
it's, it's always a discussion because, you know, now being on the board, I've sat in on, on several expedition flag discussions. So there is no like clear cut and dry criteria, but generally the idea is, is if you're going to do something that is beyond a credit card adventure, you know, you're, you're putting some skin in the game, you're going someplace really off the beaten path, uh, you've helped to plan or organize it, whatever it may be. And if uh, the committee recommends to the board and the board approves it, you're then eligible to carry the flag of the Adventurers Club into the field, which when you think about the history of this club and uh, you know, 100 years of members carrying these flags all over the world, it's a pretty cool thing to, to be a part of that, that tradition and that lineage and uh, you know, to feel like you've done you know, some small part to contribute to the club's history and their record of, uh, of adventure. So I've, I felt yeah. very, very lucky and very humbled to be able to take that flag down there and uh, got it signed by everybody on the team, the Colombians, the Brazilians, the Americans, the French Canadian guy, the Serbian, so we had a nice international list of kind of signatures to round out the, uh, the team that had been down there. That's cool. And is it hanging in the dining room now? It's hanging in the dining hall. Outstanding. So yeah. as the program chairman, I will mention another criteria for, for uh, um, carrying the flag. Yeah. If you carry the flag, you may know this, you do owe the club a report on that expedition when you come back. Yeah. I think I still owe you that report. I think you still owe the report yeah. so we can put it on the website. Yeah. But again, I think on top of that, um, to have people come and give programs. So yeah. if you're out there and you've done like a, a, like part of the report is just giving a program, right? Yeah. And the second part is an actual report that we can put in the archives for posterity. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if you've recently car carried an expedition flag and you're watching, make sure that you uh, forward those reports so we can get them on the website. Yeah. You and do owe me one. I do. I owe you one. And I, know <laughs> I wasn't even trying to throw you under the bus because you're sitting here Giving no, us this well, great, I remember because it's important. But, I know it's super yeah. important. It's the written record of, of the club, and uh, yeah, it's. I think it's one of the coolest traditions we have. And like yeah. I said, I just feel very, very lucky to. Uh, it, it gives. It definitely gives a different uh, dynamic to whatever trip. You know, to have that flag tucked away in your pack. Oh yeah. It 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 hangs over you in the best way, and you know, it really inspires you to try and, and live up to the the ideals of the club. Yeah. You know, if you're ever feeling scared in your little jungle hammock, it's like, oh, I got the f club flag in my pack, yeah. so <laughs> suck it up. All right. Next question comes from Michael Lawler. Did you take any gifts for the Matisse? What were they, and how were they received? Yeah, so I think uh, most of what I mentioned already, the gifts that got brought down were boat motors. That's uh -huh. big for them. Uh, machetes, uh, some general cooking implements and cook stoves and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, generally, obviously, really well received. That stuff's become crucial uh, to their livelihoods down there. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing, like I said, was is they've always got an eye towards upgrading mm -hmm. and, and getting the better stuff. So, you know, they, they were very appreciative, very um, glad to have that stuff. But we're also like, next time, if you could bring us an entire boat, that'd be great. <laughs> so, Did you bring them any, any sort of uh, like small, small things that you could give away? I think some of the people on the trip brought some like candies and stuff for the kids. Yeah. Um, generally, I didn't bring anything. I, I had brought down some art supplies. Actually, I don't. I didn't include a picture of it, but we did have a little like art, arts and crafts like drawing session for mm -hmm. the kids. So they got. I gave you know brought down some like Crayola uh, markers and, and paper and stuff for them to have. Uh, but like I said, a lot of those kids go to school up in uh, Adelaide Norte, which is a town. So I'm sure they appreciate the markers, but it wasn't like some yeah. revolutionary thing. They got this marker now. I'll tell you what, if you can get them some of those, those drawings that you made back, that, that would yeah. be hugely impactful, I would imagine. No, I think they'd appreciate it, for All sure. Right. Let's move on to the next question here. Next question. Well, actually, before we move on to the next question, I just very quickly want to say happy birthday, Mr. President. Oh. He just had his birthday uh, on August 25th. So oh, nice. Thank you. And are you like the youngest president? 36 now? I'm 27. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so a bit, a bit younger uh, than some, you know, a lot of the club members. Yeah. I was reading an article about the club today. I yeah. mentioned you were somewhere in your mid-30s. I know. They misquoted me. I, I, in the article, I talked about wanting to come here for, like, mentorship and, yeah. like, to learn. And, and, like, that I was this young guy looking for, you know, uh, mentors. But then they said I was, like, 35. And I thought, that doesn't sound as cool, looking for, like, mentors when you're 35. <laughs> So I was misquoted. I'm 27. Okay. Now we got your age nailed down. Some of these other guys we got in the club, we don't know how old they are. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next question, please, Andy. 
Well, speaking of not knowing the age, here's a young buck in Scott Crawford who wants to know what is off the beaten path and what does it mean to you? To be off, well, I mean, it's, it's tough and I think it's as broad as like our definition of adventure at the club because I think there's a literal element to that where you can literally be someplace that's hard to get to that not many people get to travel. But, you know, my whole leverage when I first joined the club too was, you know, playing up the art thing that that experience gave me an off the beaten path experience of, you know, sometimes really well-traveled places. Yeah. You know, that you can go to a tourist site, but if you bring kind of a different element to it or you engage with it in a different way than most people engage with it, you are having kind of an off the beaten path experience with that place. So That is true. I think it's, you know, it's, it's broad. And I think the, the spirit of it always is, you know, for this club in general is personal growth. Like if the point of, of you traveling is to, to find out something about yourself or to learn something about the world, um, then, you know, you're going to just naturally kind of gravitate towards those off the beaten path experiences, whether that's the skill sets or the, the, the talents you bring to that place and how you engage with it. Or if it's, you know, you physically looking for difficult and hard to reach places, um, you know, those two go hand in hand of, you know, growth oriented traveling. Well said. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Next question, please. Next question comes from Raimundo Perez. And Ray, one of our new members, actually, yep. says, great interview and engaging stories. How many pieces of art were you able to complete over the course of the trip? God, I would say over the course, probably between 15 and 20. Mm -hmm. So I went down there with way too many sketchbooks. You know, <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to fill all this up. And then, you know, so much of the, the day was filled with these, you know, hunts or activities. And I'm trying to sketch in between, you know, uh, you know, doing one, like some guy would take a, a, a stance with his blowgun and I'd try and get a quick sketch and then he'd take off. And so I didn't get as many sketches as I would have liked to on site. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I still hope to, to come back and kind of flesh out that portfolio do some more based on the, the stuff I started down there, do some more based on some of the photos I took, and, uh, you know, who knows where it'll go. You know, I would love to some, find some way to get it out there, and if there's some way in a roundabout way that it could go back and help the Matisse and they could benefit from it, uh, that'd be great too. Hmm. How many days were you down there for again? Uh, we were down there for five or six days in the jungle. So you did, like, at least three a day, if not more. That's quite a bit. Yeah, well, I mean, it dep I mean, considering they were like 20, 30 minute sketches each. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad, but compared to, you know, some, and, you know, now I haven't been in the, the field with other artists, um, especially some like the Marine Corps artist guys, it's like sun up to sundown. They're just cranking out drawings. Huh. They put everyone to shame. You know, they're, they'll go on a, a five day assignment and come back with a hundred sketches. So wow. it's, I mean, granted they have, they have a lot more experience, but it and definitely you touch them up when high. you get back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it depends on some artists, depending on how hardcore they are about the field dynamic, might say it's borderline to come yeah. back to your studio and kind of do it after. But at least I figure it's grounded in personal experience. I don't know, man. I'd come back and I'd redo the whole thing. Yeah. I'd look at it and I'd, I'd clean sheet yeah. from the beginning. Well, I've definitely been, I've done a couple of those as well. Yeah. So. Revision is the key to perfection. Yeah. Right? Well, as long as it captures the spirit, you know, yeah. I can still reach back and be like, yeah, that was, you know, right. no that was my experience. For me. All right, last question, please, Andy. Final question of the night. And before we get to that, thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love to see it. We love to see the engagement. And we hope to see you next week as well. The final question is, what was in the Chichawasa? That's a good question. A Chichawasa is rum with some lime with some kind of mix that's like similar to margarita mix, I think. Okay. It was kind of like a margarita. Like I said, I had no hand in making it. I just drank a lot of it. Sounds like something that'd be great for me. tiki night. It would be. Can I mean, honestly, it? yeah. As a like, Serbian guy, right? You can get him on the phone. Yeah. Well, it, it, I'm sure, I mean, you could find a recipe for it, but as, as jungle cocktails go, it hit the spot. Yeah. At the end of the day around the campfire, oh, yeah. Chichawasa was the way to go. So no complaints Good deal. There. Yeah. Hey, Alec, thanks for being with us tonight. We appreciate you filling in in the last minute for this program. Of course. Um, it was fantastic. Hearing about this trip is just amazing. You know, this is, this is like a great example of what a flagged expedition should be here. So I think you've done the club a great service by carrying our flag on that. We appreciate that. Um, thank you guys all for tuning in. Yeah. Um, next week, we got Dave Finneran, right? 
I believe so. Dave Finneran's coming to talk about all things treasure hunting, finding lost cities. It's going to be great. Dave Finneran's another one of those great members in the club that has, that has a ton of stories to tell. Um, so tune in next week for that. Uh, remember, like this video, subscribe to our channel, all that great social media stuff. Share this with your friends if you think it'd be interesting. And we will see you next week right here on Thursday, 745. At the Adventures Club. Los Angeles.